So today we're going to continue on with our discussion about Forex. Now you would remember that in last week's lecture we went over some definitions. All right, we did a few definitions and then we um, spoke very briefly about unhedged items. Remember when we said unhedged, unhedged means there's no protection. So we spoke very briefly about unhedged items and we learned some important things. Now, what important things did we learn? The first, and you know, students are always, I, I anticipated that there will be a lot of students in today's lecture looking for tips for the test. So um, I'm giving you tips for how to do a Forex question, which won't help you in test five, but um, these are the tips. The first tip is you need to identify your monetary and non-monetary items, okay? So let's talk about monetary and non-monetary items. Monetary items are items that are settled in a fixed amount um, of cash in the future. So items that are settled in a fixed amount of cash in the future. So basically, if I have a creditor that I'm owing money, all right? Um, two years from now, I can't tell the creditor, you know, because when I bought that, um, that specific thing, it cost 100 rand, but now it costs 80 rand. Can I not just pay you 80 rand? That's not how it works. That creditor expects me to pay him his 100 rand, right? So the amount that uh, I need to settle that specific creditor in is called a fixed amount. So it doesn't change with time or with um, uh, inflation or sometimes even with the exchange rate, okay? So you can view this because we're talking about Forex, right? So when we are dealing with a foreign creditor, right? The foreign creditor wants to get paid, let's say $100. Regardless of what happens, he wants his $100. So that, that amount is fixed. Okay, can you see that? So that's called a monetary item. Non-monetary items, other things like um, inventory, PPE, those types of things, the amount for which it's settled is not always fixed. So for example, when you sell uh, PPE, um, you need to go into the market and, and the market, let's say you want to sell a car, um, you can get a general idea of how much the car, how much you'll get for, for the car when you sell it, but you never know the exact amount. There's no fixed amount, right? And that, and you can't calculate, and the fixed amount doesn't stay the same from one year to the next. So you know the value of cars change from one year to the next. Therefore, when you look at things like PPE, you can say they are non-monetary because they don't have a fixed amount. The amount changes over time. So as a result, um, there's something like, like um, PPE or inventory, for that is what we call non-monetary, okay? Uh, now, we also learned about a few dates, guys. So the first date is transaction date. And what happens on transaction date? Risks and rewards, transfer, okay? Risks and rewards, transfer on transaction date. Then we had year-end date. And what did we say about year-end date? We need to remeasure our monetary items at year end date. Okay, we need to remeasure our monetary items at year end date. Settlement date, we need to also remeasure our monetary items on the settlement date as well. Okay, so last week we wanted some examples. Here are examples. So we're going to do two examples, three examples, in fact, today. Um, so the first example. Right, so I'm going to, so it, the required says, prepare the relevant journal, journal entries for the years ended 31 March 2015, 31 March 2016 in accordance with IFRS. We're just gonna do 2015 um, because 2016 is, is technically a repeat of that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, so 2016 is a repeat, so we're just gonna do one um, and then so if we have a look at the information, so it says on 1 January 2015, A Limited placed an order for the purchase of inventory, I mean, machinery from XYZ Limited 
at, at $20,000, right? So on 1 January, they placed an order to purchase machinery from XYZ Limited at $20,000. Now tell me, is that the transaction date? Right. Let's while you think about that, let's read a little bit further and then you can give me a, an answer. Um, so it says the machinery was shipped free on board, right, on 1 February 2015. And the creditor is payable on the 31st of April 2015. Right? So is the first of January our transaction date? The answer is no. Why? Because when an order is placed, risks and rewards don't automatically transfer. Right? Risks and rewards don't automatically transfer. Okay, so our transaction date then is the 1st of Feb. Okay, so let's draw a timeline. So we've got here 1st of Feb. Okay, that's the 1st of Feb, that's our transaction day. We can even write at the top TD. TD stands for transaction day. Um, then we have this period of time that passes, and then this is the 30th of the fourth month, which is April. Okay. And this is what we're going to call this is the settlement date right because the creditor is payable on this date all right what are we missing here what is missing type your answer out in the chat what is missing there's something missing on our timeline The year end is missing. Because remember the year end is 31 March. Right? The year end is missing. Okay. Okay, so then it gives us the rates. So we got the direct quotations. We've also got the indirect quotations. Remember with the indirect quotations, we want to do what? We want to, what's the operation? We want to divide. With the direct quotations, we want to multiply, okay? And then it gives us all of the dates. Now, in the example, right? So this example here, right? So remember, we are dealing with A limited. So we're accounting for A limited. Right? We are the accountants for A Limited. A Limited purchased from XYZ Limited. Okay, so in this specific example, what is the monetary item? What is the monetary item? Is it PPE? So is it the machinery? Is it the creditor? Or is it the debtor? Right, you're gonna answer now. I'm putting up a poll. Okay. So in this example, what is the monetary item? Is it the creditor? Is it the PPE? Or is it a debtor? Okay, let's have a look. While you guys think about that, just remember A, P, P, E, B, creditor, C, debtor. So let's read the question again. So it says, we are the accountants, obviously, of A Limited. And it says, so A Limited placed an order for the purchase of a machinery from XYZ. The machinery was shipped uh, free on board. Okay, so what is the right answer here? Okay, so let's have a look at our, unfortunately, there's four people that haven't answered and they can, they're obviously swing votes, but anyway. Um, so the majority of people answered B. Now, what is the, why did they answer B? Let's go and have a look. 
right? So, so the majority of people here, three out of this class answered B. And so A is not a monetary item because remember we said things like inventory, PPE, machinery, their value will change over time, okay? Their value is not at a fixed rate. It changes over time. And when something changes over time, it's non-monetary. And here we ask for the monetary amount, okay? So when it changes over time, it's non-monetary and we are being asked for the monetary amount. So we know it's not PPE, okay? Then the debtor. So if we are purchasing, okay, if we are purchasing, something, how can it be, how can we create a debtor? Remember, debtor is when someone owes us money. But if we are purchasing from someone else, then we're going to owe them money. So it cannot be a debtor. So the answer must be B, creditor. Okay, the answer must be B, the creditor. Okay. Right, so let's see what... Oh, so the, uh, this is what it's saying here. The answer is B, the creditor. Okay, so now let's have a look at, we want to try and value or, or not value, we want to try and raise the creditor. Okay, so let's have a look at how we're going to do that, right? We want to try and raise the creditor. Now our transaction date is, what's our transaction date according to our timeline? It's the 2nd of February. Okay, and we're buying $20,000 uh, worth of something. So we start off here by saying $20,000, right? Okay, so we've got $20,000 and we want to actually translate it at which rate? At the rate on the 1st of February, because that is our transaction date, okay? So we want to translate it on the rate at the 1st of February. So what does that look like? So we're gonna say then um, times, and the amount there is two rand 70, 260. Now, now you guys are gonna type this out in your calculator for me and give me the answer of what we should translate this thing at. So what is the answer? What is the value of this inventory? So type that in, out in your calculator and tell me what is the value of this inventory? What is, or the machinery at least? What is the value, right? So someone says, someone says 54, 520, anyone else? Right, okay, great. So that is the value of the inventory, okay? So, I mean, the, the machinery. So let's have a look at what that journal entry will be like. We know we must debit the machinery because we're buying new machinery, right? It has to be debit machinery. And then we want to credit the creditor for the amount of 54,520. Now look at the, the, how they did the calculation. We, we use this approach, right? The direct approach. Um, you can also use the indirect approach, but you get that small rounding error of six rand, okay? There's a rounding difference of six rand, okay? And notice how we said there's no general entries passed at, um, in January, one, first January when the order was placed because there was no actual change uh, in the in the risks and rewards. So the risks and rewards did not transfer on that date. So therefore there's no journal entry on the date that the order is placed. Okay, so that's important. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to, the, to, to our timeline, right? So, so far what we've done is we've um, tick, we've done that one. Now we want to proceed um, and we want to move on. So, so we, we're moving on in time now. So we, we want to come up to 
this thing called year end. Okay, so we want to come up to year end. And what, what must happen at year end? We must restate our monetary items, right? We must restate our monetary items. So let's go back there. Uh, we said that our monetary item is the creditor. So we want to restate our creditor. Okay, so we want to restate our creditor. Currently, our creditor is sitting at um, 54,520 rand, right? So we want to restate this creditor. Okay, so how would we do that? Right, so let's go and have a look at, at year end. So, so March is our year end, okay? March is our year end, and that is the amount, right? That is the rate, so it's 2 Rand 6480, okay? 2 Rand 0.6480 is the, is the rate. Now let's recalculate, let's recalculate together. We're going to recalculate what is the new balance, the year-end balance for our creditor. So we'd say twenty thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars, multiplied by two rand sixty-four eighty. Okay. So what is so then? What is the new amount? What is the new amount? Right, what is the new amount? Right, so the new amount, as you can see there in the chat, the new amount is 52,960. 52,960. So, if we look at those two amounts, you can actually look at them directly in the chat. We've got 54 uh, above, so 54,520. Then it, we've got a different amount, uh, the new amount at 52. 960. So what is happening to our liability? Is it becoming bigger or smaller? Type your answer out in the chat. Is it becoming bigger or smaller, this liability that we're dealing with? It's, it's, it was 54, right? It, now it's 52. So it must be coming. It must be becoming smaller right, so now i've got a question for you okay so now i've got a question for you so if we have a liability let's call it let's say it's a creditor right if we have a creditor and the creditor gets smaller okay if the creditor gets smaller what can we say about that can we say number one it's a loss, it's a bad thing, right? And it's a bad thing because there's more money that's going to flow out of, of the entity. Can we say B, it's a profit, there's a profit, it's a good thing. Um, you know, the amount that is leaving the entity is not gonna be as big or it's going to be smaller, right? Or do we say C, nothing actually has happened? What, what would you say? What would you say? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing when a creditor decreases? When a creditor becomes smaller, is it a good thing or a bad thing? All right, so let's have a look at what people have said. So there we go. The majority of people have said, yes, it is a good thing. All right, so it's a profit. So it's a profit. We're making a profit here. Uh, just just out of interest, what is the difference between these two amounts? So 52, nine, uh, 52, sorry, 54, 520 minus 52, 960. What is the difference? Type your answer out in the chat. What's the difference between these two amounts? Okay. While you guys um, do that, so while you guys do that, so the correct answer here is profit, right? Correct answer here is profit, okay? Most of us got that, right? Now, this is the next task. I want you to type either A, B, or C into your chat box, right, to this question. Now, so far we dealt with what happens if a creditor, okay, the creditor becomes smaller, right? So that's what we're dealing with there. 
Now, would your answer change if the debtor became smaller? What would your answer be if a debtor became smaller? Type your response, either A, B, or C, out in the chat. Would, would, the, would the answer change, or what would your answer be if a debtor became smaller, if a debtor decreased? What, what do you think would have happened? I'll give you a few. No one knows what to say here, it seems like. <laughs> there we go. Now some people are starting to talk. So if a debtor decreases, it's a bad thing, right? It's a bad thing. It's a loss. So can you see how, depending on whether it's a debtor or a creditor, the um, loss or profit actually changes, right? So that's the first important thing that we must learn. It's dependent on whether we're dealing with a debtor or a creditor. We must always ask ourselves, is it a good thing or a bad thing what is happening here? Right. So, so far, we've calculated the rate at the transaction date, which is the 54 520. Then we've calculated the new rate, and you guys have correctly calculated for me the difference or the change, right? And that change is 1,560. You can see it in the chat box. Now, when we're dealing with a with a loss, on what side would a loss in, uh, uh, increase? Would it be on the debit side or the credit side? It would be on the debit side right because it's an expense it's something leaving the, the business it's a loss so we would have here forex loss right we're going to have forex loss and then the creditor is um sorry we, we we're dealing with the actual actually a, a profit so i don't know why i'm talking about loss so in our in our example, we've got um, debit credit, right? When the debtor decreases, would we debit it or would we credit it? We would. What would we do? Type your answer out. What would we do if a debtor decreases? Debit or credit it? We would debit it. Okay. So that's what we're doing in this journal entry. We are debiting the creditor, meaning we're decreasing the creditor, and we're accounting for the profit because when a debtor decreases, it's a positive thing, it's a good thing. So if you have a look at our calculations, it's exactly the calculations that we did. We started off with this at transaction date, then we reduced it to come to the correct rate that we need to have at um, year end date. Right? And the difference was a profit, which we actually uh, recognized in that journal entry. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're going to see here, and this is an important thing that I'm trying to teach you, is you're going to see that this example, it works. We can use a shortcut or alternative method when we are using direct quotations. Notice these are direct quotations. All right. Now I'm going to show you in a little while how it does not work if we're using indirect quotations. Right? It's not going to work if we're using indirect quotations. So in your test and exam, I would rather prefer that you use the method above or the method that I've taught you to calculate the difference. Okay? That is, this is the better way of doing it so that you don't get confused. Okay. So now we've changed or we've raised the debtor, we've, we've, we've restated the debtor at year end. Now, when else do we need to restate the debtor? Just before we settle, right? Just before we settle the debt. Okay, so when are we gonna settle the debt? We're settling the debt in on 1st or 30, 30th of April, 2015. And now this is going to be our new rate that we need to restate the creditor to. So let's do that. Let's try and restate the creditor to the new rate. 
So we're going to have twenty thousand um, dollars, and we're going to multiply it by two rand eight uh, sixty-eight. Okay. And what amount do we come up with? What amount do we get when we when we calculate that? Pop your answer in the chat. We have twenty thousand dollars, and then we restate it at the settlement amount of two rand. 68 right and the answer is 53600 okay so your answer is 53600 what's happening is our data becoming bigger or smaller is there a profit or a loss right now we're moving from 52 to 53 so our our creditor, at least, is becoming bigger. Our creditor is becoming bigger. When our creditor becomes bigger, what happens? Do we have a profit or a loss? We have a loss. Right. So our, our creditor is becoming bigger. Now we have a loss. Right. So let's go um, have a look at, at what that looks like. So, so this is just a, I just wanted to show you what it looks like in a T account, just so that you know. So for example, we'd, we'd come in with the machinery there and then we'd restate it um, by debiting the, 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 the creditor. So we're decreasing the creditor by putting in that, that difference. And now let's have a look at what happens at year end. So at year end, we again have used the balance that we most recently uh, restated the the creditor too, which is the 52,960, right? And then we we calculate and restate it to the new amount of 53,600, right? Which gives us a loss, right? Which you guys correctly identified, gives us a loss of 640 rand. Now notice how we pass the the loss journal entry. We want to credit the the creditor, meaning that we're making the creditor bigger, and then we debit the loss. And why do we debit the loss? Because the loss is an expense account and increases on the on the debit side. Okay, for that amount. Notice now we only have changed the creditor. We have not passed any additional journal entries for the machinery. The machinery. The only journal entry that we passed for the machinery was the very first one, um, this one here, in which we recognize the machinery. That's the only journal entry we passed for the machinery. Why have we only done one? Is because it's a non-monetary item. Okay, it's a non-monetary item. Any questions so far? Does everybody understand what we're doing? Does everybody understand how we got to the spot or how we got here? Right. Again, I'm just trying to show it to you in a T account so that you become familiar with it. We've got the machinery um, that comes in. Then we restate it. We then have to restate it again just before we settle. And then finally, we need to eliminate it by sending it off to the bank account. Right. So we, we, we would uh, debit the creditor and credit the bank account. Okay. Everybody understand? Give me give me a thumbs up if you understand what we're doing so far. If you don't understand, please tell me where I've lost you or where where you at, and then I can come fetch you. <laughs> Class is very quiet today. Okay, there we go. Okay. Now, I want you to turn to your textbooks. So on page 158, turn to page 158. I have made some notes for us in the slides, so it will help us. But these are the things that I want you to remember. First is we have to use a timeline. Right? It's the only way to get the answer right, is to try and create a timeline. That's why you saw we did the timeline in the last question, right? So we want to try and make a timeline for all of our questions so that we know which journals to pass when, okay? 
We also want to make sure that we pass journals in the right, on the right date. Because if we don't, we are going to end up with a with an amount um, in the journal that's going to be incorrect, right? And we can even have a situation where it was supposed to be a profit and we, we recorded it as a loss, for example. So we want to make sure that we are aware of the date in which we need to pass the journal. And then finally, we want, want to pay careful attention to the account names. So remember, we're dealing with accounts like foreign uh, exchange loss, foreign exchange gain. Or, or profit. We want to make sure that we actually highlight whether it's a whether we think it's a loss or a or a profit. So just make sure that you that you're very keenly aware of that. Okay. All right. Now let's have a look at um, 12.8. So again, it tells us prepare the journal entries for the years ended um, 31 December 2025 or 2015 and uh, 31 December 2016. Right, so um, if we read um, in the information, it says on 1 July 2015, Omer, sorry, Okma uh, Limited purchased inventories from Durko's, a supplier in America, at a cost of one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. Right, one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. It then says that the goods were shipped free on board or FOB on twenty eighth July twenty fifteen. So which is our transaction date? It's that date, twenty eighth July twenty fifteen. So let's start with our timetable, our timeline at least. So we've got 28, there, 28 July. All right, so that's our first our transaction date. Right, it says the goods arrived on the 15th of August. Is that date important? No, because um, when the goods arrive at our premises is not important. What is important is when the risks and rewards transferred. Now, because they were using FOB, right, when it was loaded on the ship is when the risks and rewards transferred. And that's what it's telling us here by saying they were shipped. Right? So it was it was shipped on the on 28th July. So it's irrelevant when they arrive in South Africa. What is relevant is when they were shipped. Okay. And then it says the Debt is payable as follows. So on the 1st of October 2015, we're going to pay $108,000. And then on the 15th of January 2016, we're going to pay $72,000. Okay. It's going to be in two parts. It then says that um, on 31 December 2015, 40% of the inventory was sold. And the remaining 60% was sold the following year. Okay, and so because they told us um, that we need to prepare something for 31st December, we know that it must be a December year end, right? So let's continue with our timeline. So the first date is our transaction date, right? Then we're going to proceed to the 1st of October, right? And what's, what's the 1st of October? It is our settlement date, but we've got two settlement dates. So we're going to call this one SD1. Okay, SD1. So that's our settlement date. Then we proceed, and then we come to 31st December. Okay, 31st December is what date? The year end date. So we have a Y. E there. Okay. Y E. And then we're going to proceed again to 15 Jan. And that is going to be the second and last settlement. Okay. So that settlement date 
two. Okay, so that is our timeline. Right, so now let's start making the journal entries. But wait, before we do that, we need to answer a quiz. So type out in the chat, is the rate that we see in this question a direct rate? So if it's a direct rate, type out I, uh, A, or is it a indirect rate? What do you think, direct or indirect? Type out your answer in the chat. So the rate in question 12.8, is it direct or indirect? Okay, it seems that there's some, we seem a bit confused. <laughs> Okay, so let's go back to the previous example and I'll explain to you how you how we identify. Right. So if we looking at a direct rate, the foreign currency is in a single unit. Okay. If we're looking at an indirect rate, our currency, the rand, is in a single unit. Okay, so if we look at this specific these specific spot rates in the question. Right, they are in the indirect format, right? Because you can see a rand is in the single unit. Can you see? Can you guys see that? Rands are in the single unit, so therefore it must be the indirect rate, which means we need to divide. Right. Remember the indirect rate, we need to divide. Okay. So it's the indirect rate. All right. So, guys, let's try, uh, take out your calculators. Now, on the transaction date, okay, transaction date, tell me what is the value of the inventory. All right. So, how are we going to calculate that? We're going to take 180. Um, one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and we're going to divide it by the rate on the transaction date, which is zero point seven three. What is your answer? What is your answer? Type out your answer in the chat. What would we? So, so let me just for those of us that are still needing to know. So we've got one hundred and eighty thousand. We're dividing it by the amount that is, or the rate that is at the transaction date, which is 0 0.37, which is 0 0.37. Right, so what is the amount? What is the value? that we need to um, record, which is 486, 486, right? And we round it off to the nearest land, which um, is gonna give us 486. Um, yeah, we'll round it off to the nearest land, okay? So what will that journal entry look like? We know that inventories is increasing, so we need to debit the inventories, right? And then we, we want to create the creditor, right? So we're gonna credit the creditor. So it's gonna be debit inventories, Creditor. Let's have a look. There we go. That's exactly what we what we decided to do. Um, notice there's no journal entry on the order day, and that's because no risks and rewards have been transferred on this date. So the only day that uh, there is a journal entry, so the first day that there's a journal entry, is the date that risks and reward transferred, which is when it was shipped. Okay, and not the date that it arrived in, in our house, in, in our premises. Okay, cool. Now, what's the next, um, what is the next part of our, uh, on our timeline? What do we need to do next? Okay, great. So now we have, let's take our thing and tick what we've done. So now we have correctly journalized 
the initial journal to create the creditor. We have since then moved on and we want to prepare for the first settlement date. Now, what amount are we settling? We are only settling the 108,000. So this is only 108,000. So what amount will we restate? Only the 108,000. So this is an important um, concept, guys. We only want to restate the amount that is being paid, right? We only need to restate the amount that is being paid. Okay, right. So how would we restate that amount? What is it currently? What is this 108? Is it's currently stated at the zero. 0.37, right? What does it need to be restated to? Needs to be restated to um, 0 0.33, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate, right? This is, this is what it looks like. We're going to calculate the 108,000, right, at 0 0.37, then we want to calculate the 108,000 at 0 0.33. Now look at what's going on here. Is our, is our creditor getting bigger or smaller? Our creditor is getting bigger, therefore it has to be a loss. You see, it's, our creditor is getting bigger, therefore it has to be a loss. So we know that we must debit the losses and credit the creditor because it, we want it to get bigger, right? And this is the amount that we do it with. Now notice how we cannot do it the alternate route, right? It doesn't make sense if we do it the alternate route. Therefore, I would rather you guys use this method, the method that I taught you, than using the alternate method when doing your calculations, okay? Right, so what is the amount that's left? So the amount that's left at year end is the $72,000, right? What What is the $72,000 uh, uh, valued at? Well, it ha we hadn't changed it, we hadn't revalued it since the, the transaction date, okay? So let's find out what it's valued at. So how, how do we do that? We are going to, so now we want to find out what the value is of the $72,000. So we're going to say $72,000, and we want to divide it by the rate that it was last measured at, which is the um, 30, 0.37, right? And what rate do we want it to be measured at? So, so that was what it is measured at, but what rate do we currently need it to be measured at? Right, which is that is seventy-two thousand dollars, and then we're going to divide it by the current day's rate or the year-end rate of zero point three four. Okay, zero point three four. Now the difference between that is what we're going to pass. Notice we only remeasured the portion that was being paid at settlement date, and the other portion. Okay, the other portions which are remaining are all then only remeasured at year end date, right? So this is what this journal entry is looking like. Okay, oh, sorry, we actually, I forgot to actually tell you guys that after we remeasure, so after we remeasured the, the, the creditor, we must also make the payment, right? So we have to credit bank because bank is decreasing and then we're going to debit the debtor because the debtor is decreasing for the full amount at the settlement date, right? So we, we revalued it here. We revalued it. It went up from, um, from 291,892. It went up to 327,273, right? Um, and and so we need to pay the revalued amount to the creditor, right? So let's have a look at the other seventy-two thousand. 
So what's happening with the other 72,000? We are remeasuring it at the new rate. So this is the year end rate, 0.34, all right? And what's happening here again? It's getting bigger. So we know we must have a loss, okay? Are there any other journal entries that we need to pass? Yeah, we need to pass the journal entry for the actual sale of the, the inventory. Now notice what the examiner is doing here. He wants to see if you are going to restate the inventory, right? But remember, inventory is a non-monetary amount. So we're not supposed to restate it right? So that is what is being tested here. So what happens is we take this 486,000 uh, and 486,486 and we multiply it by the 40 to get the cost of sales, right? Or the amount that we must decrease the asset with, the amount that we must decrease the inventories with. And we need to process that journal entry to show the examiner that we have not restated the inventories amount. Okay. Does everybody understand that so far? Right? Everybody understand that? Okay. So the, the, the remaining part of this example is just a repetition of what we've already did. Um, so I'm going to leave that for you guys to go through. Right? You guys are going to go through that in your own time. And for now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a five-minute break, and I'm going to see you back here at 14.25. Please come, go and drink your, your uh, energy juice and come back with a lot of energy because we're going to do a topic um, that might need a little bit of brain power. So now we're going to have questions and um, just a five-minute break. See you back in five minutes.
Okay. Okay. So let's uh, proceed, right? So, so far what we dealt with is we were dealing with the situation where we were buying, right? We also want to remember that it can be flipped around where we are selling. So instead of having a foreign creditor, we can also have a foreign debtor. And remember, that's what we were doing when we looked at that one quiz and then we switched it around and said, what happens if the debtor decreases and that sort of stuff. So you need to be prepared um, for that type of example where it isn't necessarily a, a liability, it is an asset. Now we're going to be moving on, okay? And we're going to start to talk about a loan. Right, a loan that's dominated in a foreign currency. What does that mean, loan that's dominated in a foreign currency? It means that the loan amount is received and then also payable in that foreign currency, okay? So we want to have a look and, and, and think about this specific example. Now, if you think of a loan amount, what, what, what are the mechanics of a loan? Right? The mechanics of a loan or, or what happens when we have a loan is uh, firstly, we get money coming into the business, right? So we get a loan uh, a cash amount that, that comes into the business. Okay. But we also need to repay the capital. And when we repay that capital uh, and or interest, it is payable on at a fixed rate. So again, that idea of having a fixed rate tells us that it's a monetary item, right? It's a monetary item. Therefore, we need to restate it, okay? So we've got this fixed rate uh, 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 capital that we need to pay back, right? So we've got the loan amount, then we need to pay back the capital, but we also need to account for something called interest, you see? Now interest, how is interest, how does interest work? Uh, interest is earned at a steady or even rate throughout the year, right? So let's say it's earned, um, it's calculated once every day on the loan balance. And therefore it's earned or incurred at a very even rate throughout the year, which means we can't use the spot rate. Because remember when we spoke about different types of rates, the spot rate is the rate of um, exchange at a particular point in time, right? Now, when we're dealing with something that is changing and incurring uh, a cost every uh, uh, day, we need to use something called the average rate, okay? The average rate. So when we're dealing with interest expense, we want to account for it at the average rate, right? Now, what happens if we only pay the interest once uh, in a year, for example. So we incur the interest every day, which we will account for at the average rate, but we then have to, when we incur the interest, we have to credit or create a liability, an interest payable liability. Now that interest payable liability is again payable at a fixed rate in the future, a fixed currency in the future, therefore, Interest payable or accrued interest is a monetary item as well, okay? So we need to account for monetary items at the closing rate at two, two dates. The first date is the settlement date and the second date is the year end. And those dates can come in any order. They, one can be before the other one or vice versa, right? So we might just need to remember that. So the interest expense is accounted for at the average rate, but the accrued interest or the um, interest payable needs to be accounted for at the year end or closing rate. So we're gonna have a look at an example just now, right? Um, so basically, we, we just wanna talk about what needs to happen at each date. So 
when we uh, are looking at the transaction date, we need to measure the amounts that we received, okay? The, the, the cash that we received, we want to measure it at the spot rate on that date. Then at year end, we only want to restate the monetary items, right? Not the non-monetary items. What are some of the non-monetary items? Interest, right? Because interest is an expense. It's not necessarily settled. Uh, the creditor will be settled that, that uh, gave rise to the interest, not the interest itself. So uh, interest expense won't be restated. Only the creditor that relates to that interest expense will be restated. Uh, okay. So then we've got any differences uh, in the foreign um, amounts that need to be paid, any differences, we call them exchange rate differences, and they need to go to your profit and loss account, right? They need to go to the profit and loss account. So that is the transaction date. At settlement date, we need to restate. What amount do we need to restate? Only the amount that is being settled, okay? Only the amount that is being settled, right? We don't need to restate the whole loan amount, only the amount that's being settled. Um, and we do so by taking any differences to the profit and loss and other comprehensive income. The Anything else, any other non-monetary items are not measured again, right? They remain stagnant, they're not measured again, okay? Right, so that's, so so far we dealt with um, transaction date, then we spoke about settlement date. Now let's talk about year end date. Very similar to transaction date. We want to remeasure the loan, right? We want to remeasure the outstanding loan, and then we want to measure the interest, okay? We want to measure the interest at the average rate. But remember, the interest is going to be debit uh, um, interest income and credit um, accrued interest or interest payable. Now, that interest payable uh, is a liability, is like a creditor. So we need to restate the outstanding accrued interest at the closing rate. Okay, And any difference between um, these two exercises the difference is going to go to profit and loss. Okay. So let's have a look at it in practice now. So now we're going to do an example, right? So I want everyone um, just to give me all your come. Just give me all your attention just for this last bit, and then we can um, proceed. Right. Let's have a look at it. Okay. So they tell us, prepare the journal entries for 20. 20 and 2021 in accordance with IFRS, okay? And then it says on 31st August, 2020, right? Ryder Limited, a South African company um, with a 31 December year end borrowed 10,000 euros from a European bank, okay? 10,000 euros. So our transaction date is the date that the borrowing happened. Right? So the date that the amount was borrowed, not when the application was put in, not when they considered the application, not when they found the person, none of that. It's the date when the borrowing and the agreement was signed. Right. So, so in this in this example, it's easy because they only give you one date, but some other examples might give you numerous dates. You need to know it's the date that the loan was granted or the date that the actual borrowing happened. Okay. So, so we need to now pass a journal entry. So, so if we look at our timeline, um, 31 August is there, All right? Transaction date, we need to pass a journal entry for that. So what is our journal entry gonna look like, All right? So let's have a look at, the, at these amounts. So we've got both spot rates on the top, and then we've got average rates at the bottom. Now the average rates is going to be for the interest expense, right? The average rate is for the interest expense. 
the top rate is going to be for the other non-monetary items. Okay, so let's see how we're going to do that. We're going to take 10 Rand 10 cents and we want to multiply it by our 10,000 euros. So what amount do we get? What is the Rand amount of this loan? Right, what is the Rand amount of this loan? Pop your answer into the chat. 10,000 euros, right, on transaction date, the, the exchange rate was 10 rand, 10 cents um, for every euro. So our, our calculation will be as follows. Okay, so we're going to say a euro. Um, uh, let's just do it like this. We're going to say euros. Here, yeah, there we go. And we want to multiply it by 10 rand, 10 cents. And the amount that we get is 101,000 rand. Okay, now how would we generalize that? So money is coming in, we're borrowing the money, right? So it's going to be debit bank, credit loan, right? Because money is coming in. This is what the journal entry looks like. So we're debiting the bank, crediting the loan, and there's our calculation, okay? So that's how we got the 101,000. Right, so let's go back to the question. So that was transaction date, right? So we did transaction date. Um, we can, uh, let's just tick to make sure that we did the transaction date. Right, we ticked there. Okay, now we want to move to the next date. So what is the next date? So it tells us, so now we're gonna continue reading. 4,000 4, euros of the capital is repayable on 31st August 2021, so that's one year later, okay? The remainder of the capital is repayable on 31st August 2022. The interest on the loan is charged at 12% per annum, and the interest is payable annually in arrears. That means there's one payment, and it's payable annually, that means there's one payment, and in arrears, it means it's paid at the end of the year, right? So it's annually in arrears. So if it was started, if the loan started on 31st August 2020, right? If it started in 2020 and one year in arrears from there is going to be 31st August 2021, which is what they say in the next statement. They say, would the first payment be due on 31st August 2021? which is correct, so that's annually in arrears. So there's only one payment for interest made and it's going to be made at the end of the year, okay? So uh, during the year, as the interest grows, we're going to be creating, we're going to have to account for a liability, an interest payable liability, okay? So let's go back to our timeline. So um, we, going to extend the timeline right up to there and on this date is going to be 31st august but this is 2020 one so i'm going to say 20.1 there right, so that's 2021 and this is 2020 okay but what is missing there's something missing in between these two dates, we have a year end, right? And our year end is 31st December, you see. Remember at year end, we need to restate, revalue all of our monetary items. Okay, so let's move now along our timeline, right? Let's move along our timeline to see what happens next right so where are we moving from we're moving from 1st august to 31st december okay let's do the easy one let's remeasure the loan the loan capital right we'll, we'll do it we'll deal with interest just now but first let's remeasure the loan capital so what amount are we going to remeasure it at I want to remeasure it at 10 rand 32 right have a look here, 10 rand 32. Uh, why 10 rand 32? 
because that is the rate at year end, all right? 10 rand 32. So we're going to have a similar calculation to the one above. In, in, in fact, it's going to look like this. I'm just going to type it out for you guys. All right. 10 rand 32. All right. So what amount do we get out of that calculation? So we say 10,000 multiplied by 10 rand 32. We get... Oh, that right. Wait, I've made a mistake now. No, I haven't. Oh, I forgot to minus the 101,000. So our new balance that we want to be at year end, right? Our new balance is 103,200. Okay. We currently have 101,000. Okay, so therefore our difference, our loan is getting bigger, so it's a loss, right? Loan is getting bigger, so it's a loss. And the difference is 2,200. Okay, the difference is 2,200. 200. Loan is getting bigger, so it's a loss. Um, and we credit the loan and debit the loss. And that is, those are the amounts. All right. So how many, now, now let's try and deal with the interest. All right. So we said interest is earned during the course of the year, evenly throughout the year. All right. So interest is earned evenly throughout the year. So, how many months have passed? Type your answer in the chat. How many months have passed since the transaction date of this loan? Let's count. So, September, right? October, November, December. So, four months have passed. Okay, so four months have passed. Right, now let's try and calculate how did I get the amount of 103, 200. So this is the calculation for 103, 200, right? So it's 10,000 euros multiplied at the closing rate at the end of the year, or the, or the not the closing rate, just the rate at the end of the year the spot rate at the end of the year, uh, to give us the total that we need, right? Um, and, and that is how we got to this, to this calculation. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's it. So that's how we got to the to the hundred and and three thousand two hundred. It's the ten thousand euros multiplied by ten rand thirty two. Right. Cool. Okay. So now let's look at the interest. Right. So I'm going to I want to just use this uh, page as a scrap page to do my workings. Right. So we've got. What what low what is our loan amount? Right, our loan amount is ten thousand euros. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to find out how much interest is there in a year. So we say multiplied by twelve percent. Right. Let's have a look at that. Right. That's it. Multiplied by twelve percent. But how many months have passed? Right? How many months have passed? We know that there's four months that have passed since the initiation of the loan. Right? So we need to multiply the rate, the interest for the year by four and divide it by 12 to give us an amount of, what amount do you guys get? What amount do you get for the interest? For the first part of the year, what is the interest amount? 
Right, that's it. So we've got 400 euros. Okay, we've got 400 euros. Okay, 400 euros. Now, for what period of time is this? The loan was initiated in, where's our timeline? The loan was initiated the loan was initiated in 31 August, and now we are finding ourselves at 31 December. So we need to find an average rate for that period. So here, the very first average rate is the rate that we need to use, right? So it's 31 August to 31 December 2020. Right, and our rate is 10 Rand 21. Okay, and the average, remember, average rate is the rate we use to calculate um, interest. Okay, so back to our calculation. All right, so you guys correctly said that this amount is 400 euros. All right, so now we're going to take our 400 euros of interest, right, and we want to calculate the 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 uh, interest at the average rate of 10 rand 21 okay and then what amount do we get when we do when we calculate it at the average rate of 10 rand 21 All right so let's pop that in our calculators 400 euros times 10 rand 21 and we're going to get an amount in rands of 4,084 rands. Okay, 4,084 rands. That is the interest amount that um, needs to be accounted for. So how do we pass a journal entry for interest? How do we record interest? Um, in this case, we're going to say debit interest, right? Debit interest credit accrued interest because we haven't paid it yet remember we're only paying it in 2021 first 31st of august right so only paying it in 2021 31st of august so this is what we have we have interest at the 4080 and then the accrued interest right so this is the monetary this the, the second one this accrued interest is the monetary item this is the item that we want to keep a track of. We're not going to restate the interest because it's not a monetary item, the interest expense. The accrued interest, though, is a monetary item. It's like a creditor. And so we want to restate the accrued interest. Okay, we want to restate the accrued interest. Right, so, so far we've measured um, the interest at the average rate. Now we need to restate, and we've restated the loan basically at year end, right? Now we need to restate this accrued interest, this, this liability, want to restate it at year end. So how would we do that calculation? How do we go about doing that calculation? Again, we start off by saying we have 400 euros of interest sitting in that account, right? And we multiply it by the closing rate of 10 rand 32. Okay, we multiply it by the closing rate of 10 rand 32. And what do you guys get when you do that? So the 400 euros, right, multiplied by the closing rate of 10 rand 32. And you should get an amount. Seems like everyone is very tired. You should get an amount of 4,128 rands. Okay, so now we've got an amount of four. So, so what we currently have in the account is 4,084. We want it to be 4,128. And the difference is going to be an amount of 44 rands. Okay, so that is the journal entry that we passed. Notice we're not going to restate the interest expense. It's not a monetary amount, right? The interest expense is not a monetary amount. We're not restating it. We're only restating the accrued interest. 
So is the interest becoming, is the liability becoming bigger or smaller? It's becoming bigger, right? Because this amount is bigger, the year end amount is bigger. Therefore, it must be a loss, okay? Because the liability is getting bigger, it must be a loss, right? So then we're going to debit the loss, foreign exchange loss, right? And we're going to credit or increase the liability for 44 rand or 44 rand. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right, so now, so far, what's happened is we have we have um, we have gone right up to year end. Now we need to do that last stretch. We need to do that last bit and get us to the settlement date. Okay, we need to get to the settlement date. How much is being settled at this date? Only four thousand euros, and the interest. And how much interest will be settled at this date? The full year's interest, and what's a full year's interest? It is 1,200 euros. How did we come up with 1,200 euros? Um, we took the 10,000 euros times by the rate of 12%. Okay. Uh, and the rate of 12%. And that's how we came up with the the 1,200 euros that needs to be paying, paid at, at this date. So let's try and generalize that. All right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to restate the 400, uh, the 4,000 euros. All right. What is the 4,000 euros currently uh, uh, stated at? It's going to be currently stated at the year end rate, and the year end rate is. 10,000, 10 rand, 32. So 4,000 euros is currently uh, um, recorded at, oops, too far, uh, at, um, it's currently recorded at 10, 10 rand, 32. We want it to go where? What do we want it to be at? So it's, it's here at 10 rand, 32. We want to move it to the settlement date rate of 10 rand 36, right? So just by looking at this, can you tell me, are we going to increase our loan or decrease our loan? What, just look at the rate and just tell me, is it increasing or decreasing the liability? Pop your answer into the chat. Is it becoming bigger or smaller? Uh, is there going to be an, a profit or a loss, right? Remember, when the liability is getting bigger, it's a loss. When the liability is getting smaller, it's a profit. Right? So this rate, so the, so the liability is increasing, therefore it is a loss. There, that's it. So, so the liability is increasing here, therefore we're going to end up with a loss. Okay. So now let's try and restate that, um, that uh, 4,000. So we're going to use this as our sandbox as our um, scrap sheet or worksheet um, and we're going to start off with 4,000 euros right we've got 4,000 euros it was currently uh, measured at 10 rand 30 okay but we want it to be measured at 10 rand 36 okay that's currently measured at 10 rand 30 we wanted to move up to 10 rand 36. I remember, I don't. I, I would rather you do it uh, the the full way, the and, and do the whole thing, um, as opposed to doing it like this, right? But anyway, and the amount that we get out of that is 160 rands, right? Like you guys said correctly in the chat, the liability is getting bigger, right? So it's going to be a loss. So let's debit loss, debit foreign exchange loss, and credit the loan amount, right? 
or to debit foreign exchange loss credit the loan amount. Right, so this is what's happened here. Right, so have a look at, at how they've done it. Debited the loss for 160, credited the loan for 160, and they only remeasured the amount that's been paid. Right, so that's a very important thing, only the amount that's been paid. So only the 4,000 euros. And then obviously, finally, they need to make the payment, right? So here they're trying to make that payment, right? And they're trying to make the payment. So it's 4,000 euros multiplied at the, at the uh, spot rate on the date of settlement. And we're going to get 41,440. Okay. Now let's try and calculate the interest. So we know, right, that we've already calculated four months of interest, right, which was 400. Can you remember? Four months of interest, which came up to 400 euros. So the remainder of the interest is going to be 1,200 euros, which is the total amount of interest for the year. And we want to multiply it by the remaining number of months, which is eight months, and divide it by 12. And we're going to get 800 euros of interest. Okay, 800 euros of interest there you can see at the top. The rate that we want to use, right? Which rate do we want to use? Well, we're moving and we're trying to calculate this amount, so we want to use this average rate there of 10 rand 34. Okay, 10 rand 34. Okay, so then our calculation is going to be 800 euros, which is the remaining interest that needs to be accounted for, multiplied by 10 rand 34. Okay, and we're going to get an amount of 8,272 rand. Now that is the average rate, right? So that is the average rate. We calculated it at the average rate. We debit the interest because remember we want to increase the interest and we credit um, the accrued interest, which is our liability. We want to try and increase it. And again, we remeasure. So after, so this journal entry is easy. The next journal entry, we're trying to remeasure the amounts uh, in this account. So what, how many, how much interest in euros is in this account? Can you tell me, can someone type out in the chat, how many, how much interest in euros is in this amount, is in this account at least? We started off with 400 euros. We've now added in this journal entry 800 euros. So, how much do we have? Okay, so we've got 1,200 euros worth of interest in this account. 1,200 euros, okay. They measured at different rates. We want to try and measure them and get them measured at the 10 rand 36, the, the rate at settlement date, okay. So how would we go about calculating that? How, what does that look like? What does that look like? Right, so what we need to do is we need to find out what is already in this account. We started off with 4,084 Rand. We added onto that the 44 Rand. And now in this journal entry, we put an additional 8,000 274 rand into that account. So what is the total amount? 
All right, so if we type that into our calculators, all of the amounts that have gone into this um, specific account, so all of the amounts that have gone into this account are there on your screen. We type this into our calculators and we know that we've got a total in this account currently of 12,400. Okay, we've got a total in this account in rands of 12,400. Right. Now, how much do we want this 12,400 to be? What amount do we want it to, to be? Right, we want it to be um, measured at the spot rate at year end, right? And now we know we've got 1,200 euros there. We want to measure it at the spot rate of 1036, which is going to give us an amount that we want in the account of 12,432. So we need to increase the liability. Notice the liability is going up, so it must be a loss. Um, and let's have a look at what that journal entry looks like. So there we, there's it here. We're increasing the liability. It's a loss. We're crediting the liability. Therefore, it's increasing for 32 Rand. And the amount that's being paid is the interest at the closing rate. Okay, it's the interest at the closing rate of 12,432 Rand. Okay, any questions? Does everyone understand where we are so far? Everyone is very tired. Um, we don't have much more to go, so don't panic. Okay, so now I just wanna quickly talk to you about uh, a few disclosure items, right? Things that we need to remember for disclosure, right? So. Entities that operate mostly in South Africa obviously will have their functional currencies in rands, right? That makes sense. Therefore, if they have loans, if they have um, uh, uh, loans in foreign uh, countries, they may need to present their financial statements in a different currency. For example, if they want to get a loan from a, from a bank that operates in the US, they may want to present their financial statements in dollars, right? Now, how do they go about making this change, right? So I say, we only need to know the theory behind this, right? They're going to translate all of their balance sheet items at the closing rate, so the last rate of the day on the reporting date, on the year end date, right? Um, with regard to expenses and income, the idea is that we need to uh, translate them at the rate when the expense or the income occurred. But in most cases, an entity will not do that exercise for every transaction that has happened. So um, most companies, it would be impractical to go back and look at each and every sale that's made and the date that it's made and look at the exchange rate and translate it like that. So what generally happens is entities will translate it because it's impractical to do it at the exact rate. They'll do it at the average rate for the year. Okay, they'll do it for the average rate for the year. Okay, um, and then any differences that occur between um, these two uh, methods or processes that we're doing will end up in OCI, right? Under a thing called a foreign currency translation reserve, okay? Now think about what that looks like. So you are busy changing your income and your expenses at the average rate. But when you move that profit into retained earnings, it needs to go in at the closing rate because retained earnings is a balance sheet item. 
right? And the balance sheet items, assets, liabilities, and equity will be done at the closing rate. Okay, so the difference between the profit on the financials uh, face of the profit and loss statement and the change in retained earnings, that difference is going to go to this um, translation reserve. Okay, that difference is going to go to the translation reserve. Right. Um, so, we need to account for all of the different, um, uh, what you call it, foreign gains and losses or foreign profits uh, and losses, foreign exchange profits and losses in the profit and loss statement. Um, and the reason why, and so there's a lot of um, back and forth on this, but the reason why we do it in the profit and loss statement is because it relates to us doing business, right? It's, it relates to our normal course of business. We are engaging in selling and buying overseas, and therefore it must be in the profit and loss statement. Now for our uh, exercises in back to 100, we are always going to assume that any changes uh, in the foreign exchange gains or losses are going directly to profit and loss, right? So we must always assume that. Uh, in the situation, now, now, okay, so let's stop, right? Now we want to talk about, remember what we were talking about in the previous slide, on this slide here? We might have a company that is a South African company, therefore it's functional currencies rands, but now it wants to present in dollars to get a loan. Okay, so what do they need to do? There's three things, and we mentioned this, I think, in the first lecture as well. There's three things that they need to have. They must explain why, right? The reason for why they want to present in a different currency. They must explain their functional currency, right? And so when they explain their functional currency, they're going to have to talk about, you know, what is the economic activity looking like? What is the majority of economic activity? Where do they operate? What country? And that sort of stuff. And then they just need to state the fact that they have a different functional currency from presentation currency, and they may even give the rates, okay? They may even give the rates. In some situations, we might have a subsidiary that is foreign, okay? Subsidiary that's foreign, and that subsidiary's currency functional currency may be different from our functional currency. Okay, again, in that situation, I want to explain the fact that this is the case and the reasons why we believe that the subsidiary needs a separate functional currency from the group company. Okay. So for, for, for back to 100, we just want to learn the theory around this, around this thing, right? So, so now let's have a look at what the disclosure will look like. So if we purchased PPE, we're going to remeasure, we're going to measure it only at the transaction date. We're not going to need to, to remeasure it at, at spot, right? In the case where that results in a creditor, the, the, the creditor must be remeasured at year end date because it's a monetary item. The, the PPE is not a monetary item. Right? So the creditor is a monetary item, therefore it's remeasured at the closing rate or the spot rate uh, at year end. Okay, now let's have a look at if we had inventory. So the first one was PPE, this one deals with inventories. Right. So inventories. The inventory again is measured only at the transaction date, but the creditor that arose from the inventories is measured at the closing rate at the end of the year. Okay, so those, uh, so, so that's what we need to do there. Now let's have a look at a last case, which is a loan. Okay, a loan. So with regard to a loan, we have a long-term uh, loan here. The loan balance must be at the closing rate, right? As well as the accrued interest at the closing rate. Okay, the loan as well as the interest at the closing rate. 
The loan will go under non-current because in most cases, we're not planning to pay it off in less than 12 months, but the interest generally is going to be paid off sooner. So therefore it goes under current. Okay. Now, if we, if we look at the, the, for the loan, if we look at the interest, remember the interest is not remeasured at year end. So it stays at the average rate, right? We will have any losses sitting under other expenses and any gain sitting under other income. Okay. And obviously we're, we're then going to need to explain what these gains are and what the losses are a bit more in detail in the profit before tax note. Okay. Cool. Um, thanks guys for attending today's lecture. Um, remember we have one more lecture um, before the test, and that's going to be on Thursday. In that lecture,